So today we can consider part three of our studies in Solomon's Temple. Today we're going to think about, uh, first of all, think about the two large cherubim in the most holy place. 1 Kings chapter 6 and verse 23. And within the oracle, he made two cherubims of olive tree, each 10 cubits high. The oracle is the holy of holies where the presence of God was and where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. Let's think of these cherubims. There were two on the mercy seat, as we know, and also these two very large ones, three and four. So there are four cherubims all together in the temple. And this reminds us of Revelation, where they are mentioned as being in the very presence of God. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. So as we said in our introductory studies, in the first part of Solomon's temple, we noted there that the temple, first of all, is a type of Christ, it's a type of the believer, it's a type of the church, but it's also a type of heaven. It's a picture of heaven itself. So there we have the presence of God in the Holy of Holies, and there we have those four living creatures, and Revelation mentions them to us. Four beasts full of eyes before and behind. So they're <clears throat> representative of the guardians of God's throne, those cherubims. We're told that they were made of olive tree wood. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, Psalm 52 verse 8 reminds us about the olive tree. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the mercy of God forever and ever. How beautiful to see that just as those uh, cherubim are in the very presence of God, in the very holy of holies, we as the Lord's people have access into that very same holy of holies, and in that perfect relationship with God that we have, we are like a green olive tree in the house of God. We can be flourishing. Then we have another verse which says, in Hosea 14, verse 6, His branches shall spread, and his beauty shall be as the olive tree, and his smell as Lebanon. So the right kind, that, the right kind of wood was used for these cherubims, because... They radiate the very glories and beauties of God who created them. And there's no beauty like the beauty that God gives us, is there? Jeremiah eleven sixteen. The Lord called thy name a green olive tree, fair and of goodly fruit. So as believers, we can indeed be like those cherubims. There are many lessons to learn from the cherubims in scripture. They are God's servants. And we are God's servants. And we're going to learn a few lessons as we go along. What was their purpose? Why did God create the cherubim? Well, the first mention of them is Genesis 3 and verse 24. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So when man sinned, he was forbidden to enter into the Garden of Eden. He was forbidden to have access to the tree of life because God's plan was that we should be saved and live forever, not live forever as sinners. Imagine how terrible that would be. Because, <coughs> excuse me, imagine the longer we live, the more sinful we become, the more sins we accumulate. Imagine if we live forever. Even if we live for 10,000 years, imagine how many sins we would have committed in that time. Imagine how utterly depraved and corrupt we would become. It was a mercy of God to prevent Adam and Eve from living forever while they were sinners. How we thank God for his plan of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ's death on the cross and his resurrection. We can live forever, but perfect, perfect, without sin, and in that perfect relationship with God. And so their purpose was to keep man out of the Garden of Eden when man had sinned. And so they're the guardians of God's holiness. And they're the executors of God's judgment against sinners. We have also other angelic beings. 
and they're called the seraphim. And they're very similar to the cherubim. Isaiah chapter 6 introduces us to them, verses 2 and 3. And above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So those seraphims who are in the very presence of a holy God, they're the perfect servants of God. They're his angels that do his commandments. They have six wings. They cover their face in reverence before God, not looking upon his face. They cover their feet, showing that their service for God is a humble service. Their glory is not seen. They cover with twain, they did fly. They flew swiftly. They, they are swift to do God's work. You know, as we study angels and we study these seraphim and cherubim, what a lesson they have for us. How humble we ought to be. How reverent before our God whom we serve. How quick to obey we should be. But what was their purpose of creation? Why did God create them? Well, we're told they cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. They are created to declare the holiness of God. Without stopping, without fail, again and again they declare, holy, holy, holy is Jehovah of hosts. Holy, holy, holy is Jehovah of hosts. So they were created, and their great joy and their great service is to declare and declare and declare for all eternity the holiness of God. And so the roles of these two groups of angels are complementary. The seraphim declare the holiness of God. The cherubim defend the holiness of God and execute God's judgment against those who sin against God. Those who sin against his holy commandments. Remember the vision of Ezekiel by the river Kibar in Babylon. There he had this great vision of the cherubims. And he saw the wheels, four wheels. And he saw four cherubim. He saw a throne. And he saw a man upon the throne. What do we read there? It says this in Ezekiel 10 verse 19. And the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. And when they went out, the wheels also were beside them. And everyone stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house. And the glory of, God, of, of the God of Israel was over them above. So what did Ezekiel see? Many are so puzzled about these verses in Ezekiel chapter 1 of these wheels and wheels within a wheel. And uh, wherever these cherubims went, the wheels followed them. And above them was the glory of God. Well, what he saw was basically this. Look at this picture. Here's a picture of a Sumerian war chariot. There's a chariot with four wheels, and there are four living creatures, of course, horses, who pull the chariot. And there's a man above on the chariot, two of them, uh, firing their weapons against their enemies. And the wheel of the chariot goes over the enemies, as you can see uh, in the picture there. And so what Ezekiel saw was the divine chariot. Proverbs speaks about this. In Proverbs 20, verse 26, it says, A wise king scattereth the wicked and bringeth the wheel over them. So the vision that Ezekiel saw was that of God's chariot coming to punish Judah. Behind the chariot of God would be the chariots of the Babylonians. A vast army was coming towards Judah. But behind that army was God who had sent them to punish his people for their sins. And so the view of Ezekiel was the divine chariot. The horses or animals were not there, but there were these four living creatures. And they were the ones who pulled that chariot along. And now who was the chariot rider? Well, we're told in the, next, uh, in the other verses in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 126, and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And what a beautiful vision Ezekiel had of the Lord himself. 
the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the commander of the armies of heaven, the most high who ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will, Daniel 4, 25, the one who was directing nations, setting up kingdoms, removing kingdoms, putting Babylonians in power, Nebuchadnezzar in power to fulfill his will, to bring about the times of the Gentiles. And so he used the cherubims who went forth and those wheels speak of the government of God that will run over and crush the wicked and scatter them. Yes, the cherubims are the executors of God's judgment. What about their size? They were quite enormous. In this depiction, you can see the high priest in the temple. Of course, the, it was not open. Uh, only once a year he could go into the holiest of all. It was a little bit different to the uh, tabernacle. The tabernacle had a veil that he went through, but the temple had a door and a veil, and the doors were folding doors, as we shall see in this study later on. And so when once a year the high priest went on the Day of Atonement, he would have been very impressed with their size. They would have been uh, towering above him, majestically showing the judgment, the holiness of God to him, creating a sense of awe as he saw these great cherubims in the holiest of all, where the glory of God was. So they were quite large, and they stretched right across the holy place. Five cubits one wing, five cubits another wing, and they completely stretched across the cube, which was the holiest of all, which was 20 cubits. As we read in 1 Kings 6, 24, and six cubits was the one wing of the cherub, Sorry, and five cubits was the one wing of the cherub, and five cubits the other wing of the cherub, from the uttermost part of one wing, and to the uttermost part of the other were ten cubits. So they were huge. They were designed to impress the awesome and majestic holiness of God. What about their wings? Well, in verse 27 of 1 Kings 6, it says, And he set the cherubims within the inner house, and they stretched forth the wings of the cherubims, so that the wing of the one touched the, wing of the, touched the one wall, and the wing of the other cherub touched the other wall, and their wings touched one another in the midst of the house. What does this signify? Well, in Ezekiel, we have a very similar uh, mention of the cherubims. In Ezekiel 3.13, I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touched one another, and the noise of the wheels over against them, and a noise of a great rushing. There the Hebrew word kissed is used. So these living creatures moved in unison everywhere. Their wings, their wings kissed each other. What a wonderful lesson for us as believers. We are God's servants like those angels. Should we not indeed move forward, do God's work in unity, greeting one another with a holy kiss and a lo love, and rever a love and care for one another? Philippians 1.27 only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Yes, those cherubims teach us the lesson, don't they? How they serve God in perfect unity, moving together, their wings kissing each other. Oh, that there should be a love amongst believers. We are called upon the Lord Jesus to love one another, even as he has loved us. Only then can we really move forward and really do things for God, and God will be pleased to bless. Let's think of their faces now. 2 Chronicles 3 and verse 13, we're told, the wings of these cherubim spread themselves forth 20 cubits, and they stood on their feet, and their faces were inward. The word inward in Hebrew just means the house or towards the house is another translation in some margins. So they're facing the doorway. They're facing outwards towards the earth. Remember, the millennium is what the tabernacle pictures, not the tabernacle, sorry, the temple pictures the Lord Jesus in his glory, in his reign as king of kings, in that millennial kingdom, righteousness, <clears throat> God's righteousness will shine out, will look out upon man in blessing. Back to those uh, cherubims, 
In Ezekiel, we read in Ezekiel 1 and verse 10, As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. So Ezekiel gives us more descriptions of these cherubims that had four faces. And of course, because these cherubims uh, reflect and demonstrate the glory of God, we expect to see the glory of God in the description of these cherubims. And it's been uh, known in the Christian church for 2,000 years what these four faces represent. And I'm sure you've heard it yourself. See, the face of a man reminds us of Luke's gospel. Sorry, there's a typing mistake there. Not Lake's gospel, Luke's gospel. Because Luke presents Christ in his manhood, his humanity. And it tells us what he felt, his sympathy. The lion reminds us of Matthew's gospel, but presents him as king. Here we read much about what he said, his authority and his, and his sermons. The ox, Mark's gospel, presents to us Christ as Jehovah's hardworking and faithful servant. And in Mark, we read much of what Christ did. The eagle, the creature of the heaven, the creature, the bird that flies high in the sky, reminding us of Christ's deity in John's gospel that presents him as the one who came from heaven, the son of God. Here we read much of who he is. He says, I am from above. Ye are of this world, John 8, 23. So you can see that these cherubims, God's servants, what they represent, his holiness, his righteousness, his glories, and his beauties. They were overlaid with gold. Hebrews 9 verse 5 says, And over it the cherubims of glory, shadowing the mercy seat, of which we cannot now speak particularly. So the writer of Hebrews, referring to the two cherubims on the mercy seat, calls them the cherubims of glory. This reminds us that in that holy of holies, the glory of God was reflected of the gold of these uh, cherubims. They were all made of gold, covered with gold, and it must have reflected that tremendous glory of God. Reminding us of Moses' psalm, Psalm 90, verse 17. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish thou the work of our hands, and establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands, establish thou it. Reminds me of that chorus we sing sometimes. I don't know if you sing it in India. I can't remember. Oh, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. All his wondrous passion and purity. Or compassion and purity. Oh, my Savior divine. All my nature refine till the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. Like those seraphim, may we reflect the glory of the Lord in our lives and his character. Now we move on to the holy place and uh, the walls of the holy place, unlike the tabernacle, were decorated. They were made of stone and covered with wood and gold and they were decorated with cherubims, palm trees and open flowers. The cherubims, of course, remind us of the holiness of God, but they reminded the priests who served, worshipping God in that holy place, that God is holy. And it reminds us that in the millennial reign, righteousness will reign upon this earth. Psalm 97, 1 to 3. The Lord reigneth. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of isles be glad thereof. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. A fire goeth before him and burneth up his enemies round about. What a glorious day is coming in that millennial kingdom of our Lord, when Jehovah will reign and righteousness and judgment will be the habitation of his throne. What a throne the Lord Jesus will sit upon like no throne ever sat upon man. A righteous and a just throne. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom because righteousness is the habitation of his throne. What a glory the Lord will have in that millennial kingdom. What a perfect government this world will have because of that righteous throne. And thus those cherubims carved all over that millennial, all over that temple, picture for us the reign of Christ in the millennium. So, 
Psalm 72 verse 7 says, In his days shall the righteous flourish, an abundance of peace, so long as the moon endureth. Because it's going to be a righteous kingdom, Christ will reign in righteousness, the righteous will flourish. They don't flourish today, do they? The righteous suffer. The righteous lose their jobs because they're believers. And they have a testimony that's not liked by the unbelievers. The righteous don't see justice in this world. Often they're persecuted, ignored, laughed at, mocked at. But in the day when Christ reigns, the righteous will flourish on this earth. And there'll be an abundance of peace. Malachi 4.2, but unto you that fear my name, shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and be grab as calves of the stall. So when the Lord Jesus, the son of righteousness, rises, rises upon this sin-cursed earth, dispelling all the darkness and sin away, what a glorious day that will be. But it reminded those priests of God's holiness as they worshipped. Psalm 29 verse 2, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. So as the priests were in there, offering the incense on the incense altar, arranging the bread on the showbread tables, lighting the lamps in the holy place. They were reminded again and again as they saw those cherubims, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. What a lesson for us as we gather in God's house today, the local assembly. Holiness, as the psalmist says, thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. Psalm 93, 5. An assembly that's lost its holiness and tolerates sin is not fit to be a testimony for God and will be removed. It's so important that we maintain close, short accounts with God, confess our sins to him, put our ways right, by his grace live the life that's pleasing to him. But when sin is tolerated and there's no holiness in the house of God, it is no longer fit for purpose. Holiness becometh the house of God. Matthew 21, 13, the Lord was grieved at what they did to the house of God and said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. How sad when the house of God, which what a local assembly is to represent, becomes a den of thieves, robbery, theft, and all kinds of sins committed by so-called believers. How terrible this can even happen today. May the Lord help us to maintain the holiness of God's house. Let's think, turn to the palm trees. And the palm trees are mentioned when the Lord Jesus came into Jerusalem as king. We read in John 12 verse 13, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Palm trees signify victory. They believe that the Lord was coming to set up his kingdom, to give Israel victory over all their enemies. So they brought forth the palm trees. Little did they know that the nation would reject him and he would be crucified one week later. Within a week, he came on the Sunday and by Friday, he was crucified. Psalm 92, 12 tells us, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. So the victory of the Lord will be the victory of the believer too. This is what we read in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 to 10. And after this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And so when the Lord comes a second time, he will be received as King of Kings. He will be received as King of Israel. Palm trees are seen because he is the victorious one. Indeed, we are told, aren't we, in 1 Corinthians 15, 25 to 26, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. So his millennial reign has to come first. 
before it continues into an eternal state. That thousand years Christ will demonstrate that he is Lord of all. He has conquered every enemy. Every enemy that rises itself will be put down. Even at the end of the millennium, when the nations will be allowed to be tempted by Satan and turn against him, he will destroy them all. And then the last enemy will be destroyed at the great white throne is death itself. And having destroyed every enemy, put down every enemy, Christ will hand over a perfect kingdom to his father, cleansed of all sinners and only containing the righteous. Then he will submit himself to his father, that God will be all in all and the eternal state will begin. What a wonderful prospect we have as believers to look forward to the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has already won that victory at the cross and by his resurrection. But what a joy it will be to see that victory demonstrated in that day to come. So those palm trees on the temple walls look forward to that victorious coming of the Messiah and his victory over all his enemies and his eternal kingdom. Then we learn about flowers, open flowers. Well, flowers picture the glory of man. 1 Peter 1 verse 24, for all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away. Man's glory doesn't last long. Like an open flower, like a flower, like grass, and it's withered away very soon. You see a man so handsome, strong, healthy. Some years later, you see them so weak and old. You see a young girl growing up and becoming so beautiful. And yet a few years later, all that beauty is gone. Man's glory is truly like a flower. It vanishes away. It falleth away. Why? Because God never made man to be like that. But sin made man into a person that dies, who grows old and weak and sick. But you know, there's a glory of one man that will never fade. And that's the blessed man of Calvary, the perfect man. His glory can never fade. And so those open flowers remind us of the beauty and the fragrance and the glories of our Lord Jesus Christ. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verses 11 to 12, speak about that. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, and the time of the singing of birds is come, and the voice of the turtle is heard in our land. What a beautiful verse that can be applied to the millennium. The winter of tribulation and judgment is gone. The darkness is gone. The rain is over and gone. The flowers are appearing on the earth. Yes, what a joy it will be when the Lord returns. Flowers will appear on the earth after that terrible tribulation. The time of the singing of birds will be heard. The voice of the turtle heard in the land. Song of Solomon 5 and verse 13 says, uh, of the Lord, it can be applied to the Lord Jesus as we know. His cheeks are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers. His lips like lilies dropping sweet smelling myrrh. Yes, our Lord Jesus is like a sweet flower. Isaiah 4 verse 2. In that, day, the, in that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. The branch of the Lord is a title of our Lord Jesus Christ in his deity. He is the branch of Jehovah, and he is beautiful. He is glorious. But we as believers also have that fragrance of Christ, 2 Corinthians 2.15. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved, and in them that perish. Let's think about a very sad scene before us. Those beautiful decorations made of the finest wood, overlaid with the finest gold, displaying the glories and beauties of the Lord. What do we read? We read they were destroyed. Psalm 74, verses 5 to 6. Asaph looks into the future prophetically, seeing the destruction of the temple. And he says this, A man was famous according as he had lifted up axes upon the thick trees. But now they break down the carved work thereof at once with axes and hammers. How terrible this was when you see the Babylonians coming and they're smashing and destroying that woodwork 
breaking the gold off it, smashing it to pieces with their axes and their hammers. What does it picture for us? Well, it pictures for us Calvary's cross. Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. John 2 verse 19. He spoke of the temple of his body. Yes, they would take their axes, they would take their hammers, and they will destroy his body. They will scourge him and spit on him and beat him and buffet him and pull his hair and drive those nails through that body. But Jesus said, destroy this body, and in three days I will raise it up. Isaiah 52, 14. And when, as many as were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So that temple being destroyed it reminds us, doesn't it, of the Lord Jesus, of whom the temple represented, how he would be destroyed by men. They would destroy that temple. They would kill him. And yet he would rise again on the third day, triumphant. Let's uh, come towards the end of our study today and think about the floor uh, and the courtyard and the doors. The tabernacle had no floor because they moved from place to place, reminding us of our Christian life. We're pilgrims, as 1 Peter 2.11 says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. So the tabernacle pictures our Christian life as we move through this world, We're pilgrims. We're moving from place to place. That's why we didn't have a floor. The desert sand was the floor, and it reminded them they were pilgrims. But the temple was more permanent. And the floor of the house, he overlaid with gold within and without 1 Kings 30. Of course, permanent in the sense as long as they obeyed the Lord, it would uh, remain. But compared to the tabernacle, it was a permanent fixture. It was not to move from place to place. Revelation 21 verse 21 says, And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was a one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. It all speaks of permanency, that golden street of heaven, that golden street in New Jerusalem. It speaks of what is permanent. As the hymn writer Gerhard Tersegen wrote, That him long the blessed guide has led me by the desert road. Now I see the coming splendor, splendor of my God. There amidst the love and glory, he is waiting yet. On his hands a name is graving, he can ne'er forget. We're heading for heaven. It will be permanent there. There will be no more moving from place to place. No more pilgrimage will be at home. W. W. Faraday, whom I mentioned before, a very fine Bible teacher of long ago, wrote this, all around the ministering priests, gold glittered. And as if this was, as if this mere, sorry, and as if this mere not glorious enough, even the gold was garnished with precious stones for beauty. 2 Chronicles 6, 3 verse 6. Truly, when we look around us in God's eternal day, not at mere material structure, but at the glorified saints who will fill, who will form his holy temple. Our eyes will behold everything that is expressive of Christ. None of his divine graces will be lacking in a single saint what God hath wrought. Yes, what a beautiful picture of the believer in that future day. Let's think of the doors. There were two sets of doors, the entrance doors to the holy place and the doors to the holy place of holies. There are two verses to read, 1 Kings 6, 31 and 34. And for the entering of the oracle, he made posts of, so he made doors of olive tree. The lintel and side posts were a fifth part of the wall. And verse 34 says, and the two doors were a fir tree. The two leaves of the one door were folding and the two leaves of the other door were folding. So they're not like the normal doors with just one door that opens. They were folding doors that bent in and opened That's how they were made. And uh, the trees remind us again of the glory of the Lord in that millennial kingdom. Isaiah 60 verse 13. The glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee. The fir tree, the pine tree, and the box together to beautify the place of my sanctuary 
and I will make the place of my feet glorious. So these, these wood trees were chosen for their beauty, to beautify the place of God's sanctuary, to make the place of his feet upon this earth glorious. Even the hinges were of gold, 1 Kings 7.50, and the bowls and the snuffers and the basins and the spoons and the censers of pure gold and the hinges of gold, both for the doors of the inner house, the most holy place, and for the doors of the house to wit of the temple. You see, gold represents divine glory and divine righteousness. We can only enter the very presence of God because of the righteousness of Christ, because of his righteous life laid down for us on the cross. That's the basis of all the blessing we enjoy, is that righteous one who died on the cross for us. And everything he does has been righteous. We read this in, <coughs> excuse me. So summing up, this, everything displayed the righteousness and glory of God. And the door could only open into the presence of God because of divine righteousness. And Christ's righteous life laid down for us at Calvary, opened the door to heaven. As the hymn writer says, Cecil Francis Alexander, there was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. So the door does remind us of the Lord who said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. John 10 verse 9. Into the very presence of God, we can come through Christ the door. There was also a veil, as you can see in this picture. There was a veil and the door as well. And it was torn, torn in two from the top to the bottom when Christ died on the cross, signifying that the way into the holiest was now made open, as Hebrews 10, 19 to 20 tells us. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. So that veil represented his flesh. When he died on the cross, the way was made open for us to enter into God's holy presence. And the courtyard, and with this we close, the tabernacle only had one courtyard for all the members of the public and uh, the priests as well. But the tabernacle, the temple, had two courtyards, an outer court, a great outer court for the people, and an inner court for the priests, and there were steps leading up to each court, so one was higher than the other. Jeremiah mentions uh, this court of the priests. It's called the upper court, the upper or inner court. So the verses are here, and he built the inner, sorry, he, and he built the inner court with three rows of hewed stone and a row of cedar beams, 1 Kings 6.36. And furthermore, he made the courts of the priests and the great court and the doors for the court and overlaid the doors of them with brass. 2 Chronicles 4.9. What does this remind us of these great courts? Well, God delights in the praise of his people, not just the priests, but he wants his people gathered around to praise him. So in the great and outer court, the people were allowed in to praise him, reminding us of these Psalms. Psalm 84, verses 1 and 2. How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Psalm 84.10, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Psalm 100 and verse 4, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Psalm 116, 17 to 19, I'll offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of the O Jerusalem. Praise ye the Lord. Can you not see the joy they had to be in that great court to praise and worship God? Of course, we don't need to go to a physical court. We can go right into the very presence of God. And as we gather in the assembly where two or three are gathered together, there, is he, there he is in our midst. Hebrews 13 tells us in verse 15 to 16, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Ephesians 5, 19 to 20, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. 
giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What a joy we have to meet as the Lord's people and praise and thank him continually for what he has done. This should be the joy and delight of every believer to want to be in the presence of God, to be filled with thanksgiving for who he is and all that he has done. May the Lord bless his word, and God willing, we'll look at the fourth and final part of our study next week. Thank you very much.